My future in Christ is so bright. I gotta wear shades. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to a special outside edition of Brett Teaches You About the Bible. We're going to be finishing 1 Peter chapter 4 today and looking at what trials mean. We're going to see where Peter's kind of, you know, he's gone on this tangent of, you know, speaking of suffering, this is how to suffer. And speaking of suffering, this is how to live for Christ. And now we get back into the, so, you know, in summation, um, we, you know, shouldn't be surprised when we hit trials and that's going to be step one but he offers us four steps here that we're going to look at for when trials happen and just kind of how to handle them um so we're going to hit chapter 4 verses 12 through 19 today it says beloved do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you and when it says happened it means like uh like that fell upon you by chance it's like you've won the long, wrong lottery in this scenario. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but rejoice to the extent that when you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the, same, for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly in the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So, Again, we're going to outline about four points here. Number one, don't be surprised. In verse 12 it says, Do not think it strange uh, concerning the final trial which is to try you. Which is to. It's promising that. That's a big theme we need to keep in mind. It says it in James. It says it here. You're going to be tested. It's just how these things work. You put your life in Christ. And so now it's saying when this happens, first of all, don't be surprised. Don't let it catch you off guard, right? <clears throat> Number two here, we get to see in verse 13, it says, But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Have joy in this. Know what the point is. Don't be, don't be saddened by it. Don't think, oh man, there it goes again. But instead think, oh my gosh, I get to partake in this. I get to feel what Christ felt. And that's what, what it's saying here is, you... Um, that you partake of Christ's sufferings. So when his glory is revealed, and so I think this means kind of, we can take this two ways, his glory being revealed, so at the end times when we you know get to heaven, or we can think of right now, you get to understand what Christ went through, understanding that Christ was totally human, right? Um, and we get to have that joy in that. I mean, and don't, you know, thinking of, Christ was very clear, and, um, oh shoot, John, uh, 15, yeah, 15, 18, 16, something like that. Uh, he says, Jesus reminds us, remember, when the world hates you, it hated me first. He comes right out and says it, which isn't the most comforting thing at the time, but comforting to know that you are partaking in Christ's suffering. It ends with exceeding joy. That's why you know, we're called to be happy people. We're not going to obviously always be in great moods, and we're not always going to feel that, but we have this joy through our life through this even through the trials, which is what sets us apart. Verse 14 through 18 kind of hits the next section. It says, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemy, but on your part he is glorified. I love that. Don't forget that the more, you know, when people attack our faith, when they attack our culture, saying, you know, Christians are like this, Christians are like that, and, you, and don't, you know, attack our God, they are blaspheming, but the way we handle it, the way we take it, the way we show our joy through trials, the way we move on, that shows glory to God, right? This would have been around the start of about a two hundred period or two hundred year period of like heavy persecution, and so he's saying, you know, you are going to get per persecuted, but it's going to glorify God, and then it gets to kind of the next part where we. we 
uh, in verse 15 it says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So um, two things here. Number one, make sure you're suffering for the right reasons. That's the third part uh, in this, is figure out why you're suffering. If you're suffering for Christ, rad, that's the point. But if you're suffering because of a sin that you're committing, if you don't suffer for the wrong reasons, he kind of hits that earlier in First Peter, and now we see it here again. Make sure that you're suffering correctly. And this, he would have actually really been talking about the government here. He's saying don't cause ripples, don't attack people. You know, our goal here is that, like, you, um, you set that example, that you live a virtuous life, and glorify Christ through that, rather than trying to be some kind of zealot, right? So, um, and then the second part is, don't be ashamed. And it's really easy to say, oh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But how hard is it to bring up a conversation about Christ with a friend? How easy is it to bring up youth group around people, or to bring up prayer around people? How many times are you the person to say, hey, let's pray before we do this? Why not? Because you feel, you know, out there. You feel wrong in that. But it's it's a common thing. I think it's something that we need to normalize. We need to normalize spiritual conversations. We need to normalize, um, you know, just looking to Christ, and especially around people. You know, it bums me out personally that I had to become a pastor before it became normal for me to have spiritual conversations. But I know even if I lost this job, even if... I had it was called somewhere else. I'm not going anywhere, by the way. That's not what I'm saying. But I know that I would continue that even after all of this. Verse 17 uh, says, For the, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if he begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So what he's saying here is not, not that like condemnation begins at the house, not that God's going to start with us and then move to the world, but instead that we need to clean our acts first, right? We have to clean up our act and move forward, knowing that we are in the house of God. That's where people are looking first. People look at the church before they look at individual Christians. They look at how we as a whole are responding, and we have to keep that in mind. We have to be united, knowing we're sinners, but doing our best. And then lastly, verse 19 gives us part four. It says, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Give it to God. When you go through a trial, that's who you give it to. Don't, you know, don't sit around saying like, oh, I'm in this alone. God is there for you. And you are supposed to give that to him. Um, so that finishes up chapter four. Again, it's so great to be with you guys. I've got two questions for you. Number one, is it normal to speak about Christ with friends and family in your life? Is it normal to speak about Christ with your friends, with your family, when you're in having dinner together, when you're uh, hanging out? And if not, I mean, first ask yourself, why not? And secondly, ask, how can you get that normalized? How can you be the one to bring up what is Christ doing in your life, to ask that question to people? Secondly, how can you be rejoicing right now? I, I don't think it's a stretch to call you know, all of this quarantine and hanging out, just a trial. Um, you know, because it, it is, you know, this is hard. This isn't an easy thing for us. It, rare, we've never been apart as a church like this before. So ask yourselves, how can you be rejoicing? What can you be looking at right now? I've heard tons of stories of people who are now getting to watch church online and they've never had the time for it. I've heard stories about people uh, just, you know, helping out one another in these times, donating, all of this. Look, at, look for that. Look at how you can continue rejoicing in that. I'll see you guys on Sunday.